Well, I think this is as good as we're going to get on the day before Thanksgiving. Well done to you guys, at least, for making it here, and all the rest are clearly slackers. <laughs> um, so I'm afraid that I don't really have a reward for you because uh, we're going to talk today about something that's not terribly happy, I'm afraid. Um, but we're, I'll tell you, um, we're going to try and get our really depressing stuff over with in the first half, and then we'll tell a slightly happier story towards the last half of the class. So because what we're going to talk today is about human impacts on the Earth system. Um, so we talked about human population on Monday and how that population has massively increased in the last sort of 100 years or so. And so the fact that there are so many of us has allowed us to have a much, much greater impact on the Earth than you might perhaps expect. And so this is my favorite image to do with things like human impacts because it really emphasizes the change, even looking from space. If we look down um, at certain parts of the world, even in the daytime, we can see human impacts. But at night especially, you can see where the people are. You can see the effect um, of humans on Earth. So as a reminder, we still have quiz nine. If you have eight 20 out of 20s already, then that's great for you. But uh, quiz nine is available if you want to try and improve your score or um, just to practice some of the, the ideas and concepts we've been going through. But you have a long time to do it because we have the extra long weekend today. OK, so I'm going to make you do a little bit of work. So I know, don't escape, unfortunately. Um, but it should be something that's really simple. So just yourself, by yourself, for one minute, I want you to either write down or think in your head, one thing, one way that humans have affected the geosphere, so the land, one way that we've affected the hydrosphere, one way that we've affected the biosphere, and one way we've affected the atmosphere. So you can think of more than one if you want, but I want you to come up with one for each of those, and I'm going to give you a minute, and then you're going to compare with uh, your neighbors and see if you came up with the same ones, OK? So think for, for a minute. OK, so hopefully everyone has something for each of those now. So now turn to the people around you and see if you've got the same things, OK? We can see how many things we can come up with for each of these. So make new friends. OK, so hopefully everyone has lots of ideas. So I want someone to tell me one way that humans have affected the geosphere. Mining, absolutely. We're going to see an example of how mining has affected the geosphere. And what sort of things do we mine for? So coal, oil, we uh, extract sort of oil in the same sort of way. What else do we use that we extract from the earth? Water. So groundwater mining is also something we do. Anything else? Sorry? So definitely fossil fuels, so things like oil, oil and coal. What else do we use that we get from the ground? Deforestation. So deforestation is another way we sort of, that definitely affects the geosphere, because it affects things like soils. Um, and so, and it also affects the biosphere. What about what your laptop is made of? Metals, Metals yeah, so minerals. So we don't only mine for fossil fuels, we also extract a huge amount of mineral resources from the earth. So things like just limestone, or clays, um, or aluminium ore, or iron ore, or lead ore. Um, all of these things that you can get from the geosphere. So we've had quite a large effect. Um, how about the hydrosphere? So someone over here, how have we affected the hydrosphere? Melting of waste. So we're causing melting. So by sort of changing our climate, we're causing changes in the amount of uh, ice on Earth. How else have we affected fresh water? The amount of fresh water. Yeah, absolutely. So if we're extracting groundwater, um, then we might be removing a certain amount of fresh water from the system. How else have we affected fresh water? Contamination, that's a really big one, and I'll show you another example later today. We've also been polluting our fresh water in the same way that we can actually pollute land as well. So we can put lots of things into our fresh water that really don't belong there and that we don't want there. Um, so things like pesticides or organic chemicals um, or even sort of heavy metals or even bacteria in some cases. Anything else for the hydrosphere, anyone? <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, so definitely we also affect the oceans to a certain extent and definitely by changing the amount of fresh water on Earth we affect things like salinity. <laughs> we also affect things like the nutrient contents close to ground. Remember we talked about eutrophication. How have we affected the biosphere then? Poaching. Poaching, so definitely by sort of hunting, hunting certain species. How else? Overfishing, and we're going to come on to talking about fishing uh, stocks later today. Anything else? Introduction of invasive species. Invasive species, so we've had impacts on our biodiversity. So all sorts of things for the biosphere, and we've just been, remember, we're taking in a lot of that net primary productivity now, so we're affecting both the distribution and number um, of uh, sort of animals and, and creatures on Earth. And lastly, how about our atmospheres? What are some of the ways that we've been messing up our atmosphere? CFCs. CFCs and ozone, we're going to talk about that later today. How about from the back? Come on, you guys. Any ideas? None at all. It's Wednesday before Thanksgiving and everyone's brain has stopped working. How about any other atmospheric uh, environmental issues? Can you think of... Uh, what do we see when we look to the north? Smog, absolutely. So things like uh, pollution with smog. Has everyone heard of acid rain? Acid rain was a problem. And of course now we also have things like greenhouse gases and climate change. So all in all, we've uh, really messed things up quite a lot. Um, there's a whole variety of things that we've done to the earth. Um, and we're having a huge impact. Um, and just because people say, oh, well, it's only us, like how could we possibly affect something as big as the Earth? We are. We are having an impact, and we can see our sort of fingerprints on all sorts of things. So first eye clicker of the day. So some of those things that we just talked about that affect the hydrosphere, at least. Which of these images is not which of these is not an image that shows a human activity affecting the cryosphere? I think that's probably everybody, so I'm going to take a look at the answers. <laughs> so no one is falling for my question today. Um, so definitely the answer would be E. So how are we affecting the hydrosphere in picture A? Dams, we've created dams, we've con we're, we're affecting the distribution of water, we're trying to keep back some of that fresh water so that we can use it, we have access to it. Um, does anyone know which dam that is? Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam, yes, absolutely. So B, does anyone know what that is an image of? A canal, it's a, good, it's a good bet. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of these um, big canals that brings water down to us through uh, from Northern California down to the south. Um, and so this is sort of part of our water supply. And you can see how really that amount of water doesn't belong in that location necessarily. Um, C, how is C affecting our hydrosphere? It's a landfill. Contamination. And so actually, uh, if you're a hydro, uh, hydrologist or hydrogeologist, you often spend a lot of your time climbing around landfills, which isn't terribly glamorous. But what happens is that all of the nasty chemicals that are in our trash that get thrown away, they sort of, if it rains or if water gets into the system, those chemicals can drain into our groundwater. And so landfill sites are a big source of contamination to our fresh water on Earth. And what does D show us? Yeah, oil spill, absolutely. So we've had, uh, we had our huge example, probably a couple of years ago now, the Deep uh, Horizon uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, which had a huge impact on uh, wildlife there, but also on human populations who rely on fishing in the region. And so, so you're right that all of these activities affect the hydrosphere. It's difficult for us to think of something that we do as humans that doesn't really have an effect on the hydrosphere because we're constantly redistributing um, water and we're constantly putting substances in. Okay? So, why does, should that sort of bother us? Because we use the environment for a lot of our resources. And so I wanted to go over renewable versus non-renewable resources. And we're just going to take a couple of snapshots of some of the really important resources that we use on Earth. 
So a resource is something useful or even necessary for us. So for, for example, the atmosphere, it's a resource, it's necessary for us because it is the air that we breathe. Um, if we are deprived of the atmosphere, we'd be in trouble. Um, and so we have to sort of look after it. So what's the difference between a non-renewable resource and a renewable resource? How easy it is to get more? How easy it is to get more? So what sort of the... So can anyone give me an example of a non-renewable resource? Yeah, oil or fossil fuels, okay. What about a renewable resource? Water. Is water always a renewable resource? What might make it non-renewable? It cycles, and how quickly does it cycle? So in particular, what sort of aspect of water are we overusing? Are we using more rapidly than it can be replaced in a lot of places? Groundwater, absolutely. So, for example, groundwater, it should be a renewable resource, right? But if we don't actually look after it, if we don't manage it, then it actually would not be a renewable resource anymore. Because especially, for example, in the Central Valley, do you remember we talked about how much subsidence there's been in the Central Valley because of the compaction? So what we've done is we've taken water out of those little pores in the ground in the rock. And what happens is that the overlying sediment then squashes down and it, it sort of compacts those pores. So now even if we had more water, we can't get that water back into those pore spaces and so we've re basically removed the potential uh, for that area to store water. So renewable resources are absolutely the ones that can be replenished and in particular on timescales relevant to us. Because even fossil fuels can be replenished if we're willing to wait maybe a hundred million years but that's not really something that we're particularly keen on doing um, and it's not really very relevant to us and so things like oil um, also can be replenished, but only if we wait for a really long time. So if we sort of call our renewable resources something that can be replenished on timescales relevant to us as people. Um, but as I said, renewable resources require management in order to stay renewable. We need to manage the amount, so the sort of the quantity and so how much of them is being used. And we also need to keep an eye on the quality. So how much polluting is going on in these cases. So, my second question of the day is which of these is a non-renewable resource? So think about our definition. I think that's everyone, so I'm going to take a look. So, 47% people said D, and they would be correct. Okay, what can we do to, to aluminium? Recycle it. We can recycle it. We're not creating more of it though. We're reusing it. And that's because aluminium is a non-renewable resource. There's only so much of it on Earth. So there's only so much of it on Earth because whatever Earth had when it was created is how much we have now. If we need more of it, we're going to have to go outside the Earth to get more of it. And that's one of the reasons why recycling of aluminium is so important because it's actually one of those things that is really very efficient and easy to recycle. And so we sort of come up with this idea is that is there a maximum amount that we need? Could we actually stop having to mine it in the future, potentially? So a lot of our minerals are getting pretty close to the point where we're sort of getting down to, say, maybe decades or a couple of hundred years of our known reserves left. And so we're having to start thinking about um, recycling a lot more of our uh, material. So less and less things get thrown away. We're trying to reuse where we can. But all of these other ones, forests, fish, groundwater, soil, if you read ahead in the notes, are what we're going to talk about now. But these are examples of renewable reserves or renewable resources, but only if we manage them carefully. And uh, following with the depressing theme of the day, we're not doing that terribly well. Okay? So forests. Forests are important for us as humans. We use them because we like them for timber and in a lot of places around the world uh, that wood is also used for fuel. Um, we use it for recreation. Um, it's a big source of diversity. It's important to the Earth system because obviously it supplies a lot of our oxygen to our atmosphere. It stores a huge amount of carbon also, which we care about a lot right now. It stabilizes soils. It stops soils being washed away because those roots 
bind all of that uh, soil together. It also has a little feedback loop. It affects the hydrologic cycle. So obviously things like rainfall will affect whether we have forests, but also if we have forests will affect whether we have rainfall. It's this really funny sort of loop, and that's because these trees contain a lot of water. They're good at extracting that water from the ground, and then they lose that to the atmosphere when it's hot through this evapotranspiration, and that raises the amount of water vapor in the air, and it makes rainfall more likely. So we have these funny feedback loops, and in fact, we've affected the hydrologic cycle in the Central Valley because we irrigate so much of the land up there that we actually are seeing potentially uh, changes in our hydrologic cycle there, which I think is pretty amazing. Okay? It also affects wind speeds, because if we have trees, it tends to slow down our wind, and so again, it's, it's good at keeping our soil in the same place. Okay? So how have we been impacting it? Well, obviously, we are very concerned about deforestation, and that's something that's been happening a very, very long time. In fact, a lot of the deforestation in Europe and North America happened sort of over 100 years ago now. In fact, in the US, we're seeing actually more reforestation in a lot of places. Um, but also, because this is a commercial crop, we have forestry lands all around the US. Um, and so more and more people are thinking about how we go about managing this resource. So the most efficient way of, of sort of harvesting wood is going in and basically just cutting everything down. It's called clear cutting. And that's what you see on the hillsides if you go along and you see a big sort of square patch that's been, sort of where trees have been removed. That's called clear cutting. Does this keep cutting in and out? Sorry, I'll try and repeat myself. So clear cutting is where you cut down everything. But of those things you cut down, probably a certain percentage you don't necessarily need or want. It isn't really useful. And so what is perhaps somewhat better for the landscape, for the soils, for the diversity, is this selective cutting. So you go in and you target the trees you want. It's much more difficult. It's more expensive. But in terms of managing the resource, is it actually a better idea? Fisheries. Who hasn't heard that our fisheries are in trouble? I think more or less everyone on Earth hopefully is aware that uh, fisheries are not in a good way. Um, we're going to cover much more about this in oceanography next quarter. Um, but we use a lot of fish for food. It accounts for maybe 20% of the animal protein in a lot of developing countries, and in certain countries that are culturally a lot more than that. Um, and it's really a very difficult resource to manage. And it's difficult to manage because a lot of that fishing happens in international waters where you have to have these big international agreements um, for, for that to take place. And so you get a lot of conflict between countries saying, well, actually, no, you shouldn't be fishing as much as, as we are. Um, and it's what we call the tragedy of the commons, that everyone can benefit from a shared resource, but it makes it very, very difficult to manage. And so right now, if we look at the oceans, 80% of fish stocks are either fully exploited, as in we're taking out as much as we actually physically can, or they're overexploited, we're taking out even more than we should be doing, or they're depleted, in, in which case they're just not commercially viable anymore. They're, they're sort of gone. And so, for example, cod. Cod was basically declared commercially extinct. It wasn't really worth fishing it anymore um, because there wasn't enough of it around anymore. And so there's sort of often bans on certain species that are sort of there to try and uh, build back some of these sort of species to, to useful numbers. Um, but obviously that's very difficult given the fishing techniques. You can't sort of pick out one species from another if you can fish with nets. And so things like uh, aquaculture, so actually commercially farming fish is, is sort of a growing uh, way that we get some of our seafood. But actually, that doesn't do a great deal of good for the environment because it produces a lot of waste, it takes a lot of energy, um, and they also use certain um, chemicals to stop some disease um, which can affect the balance of the rest of the ecosystem. So it's, it's one way, but it's not necessarily a perfect way of addressing this. Um, and this resource is threatened, um, first of all, just by overuse because we're not managing it carefully but also then by pollution, so things like our big oil spills that we saw in the Gulf of Mexico, eutrophication, remember that input of phosphorus from overuse of fertilizers, which therefore causes excessive plant growth and that reduces available oxygen. And then also ocean acidification, 
So you think, well, it's a fish, it doesn't really care, right? Fish have these funny little ear bones that are made of calcium carbonate, and they use them to sort of help sort of work out how deep they are and where they're going. Um, and we don't have a good sense of what ocean acidification is going to do to their little ear bones. But also remember, ocean acidification is going to have a big impact on the fundamental um, sort of base of the ecosystem. And so that could have quite a big effect on our fish. So this resource is uh, really not in a good way. Then we have soils. We are also not treating soils as we should, the running theme of the day. So we need soil because it's obviously important if we want to grow our food supply. We need it to be sustainable and we need it to be uh, good quality. Um, but we're losing a lot of soil by erosion um, and also by contamination and loss of nutrients. Because in the past, do you know what, how people used to sort of replenish nutrients in their fields? If you're a small farmer, would you grow wheat in the same field every year forever? What would they do? Yeah, they would leave it fat fallow. So if you leave that field with nothing in it for a while, it has a chance to sort of replenish its nutrients. And so often you'd leave fields fallow, or you'd also change up the type of crop that you grew in that field. But we don't see that so much now. We have what we call monoculture farms in a lot of places where all they grow is wheat or all they grow is corn. And so you're not necessarily sort of leaving that land to recover. And so that can cause loss of nutrients. And how do we address that? Fertilizers. We put fertilizers back on. Um, and so things like our green revolution, which I mentioned on Monday, because it's one of the ways that we've been able to grow enough food to support our huge increase in population, they increase productivity of the land by maybe three times by using things like irrigation, pesticides, um, fertilizers, um, but that doesn't necessarily help us sort of keep hold of that soil. Um, and so worldwide, we lose maybe 25 billion tons of soil every year. That's a huge amount of soil. And it takes soil a long time to, to regenerate. It might take a generation for soil to sort of so come back. And so um, really, this could be the limiting factor on how much food we can produce. Do you remember I said even the available land that we are using right now is, is degrading. We're, we're sort of losing some of that land because of this sort of factor. I mean, in really extreme cases, it can lead to desertification. And so what that ha means is that uh, the deserts basically expand into areas that were previously viable land for growing things or grazing animals. And especially to blame our goats. Goats will eat anything, as you've ever, if you've ever met a goat, then they will try and eat anything. Um, and goats are really good at sort of desertifying the land. Um, so overgrazing of livestock is a big way um, that desertification can happen, as well as things like climate changes. And can anyone think of a desertification episode in US's history? The Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl. Remember the Dust Bowl? When we see images like that, so desertification was this period in the 1930s in the US where um, there was this big disaster and it was to do with soil. And it was to do with the fact that we'd sort of just sort of started farming this enormous expanse of land in the center of the country. And we cleared all of the previous sort of nice grass vegetation that was holding the soil together. And that was followed by a couple of really, really dry years, sort of drought. And what that meant was that basically there was nothing holding the soil together. And when we had big windstorms, we got enormous, enormous amounts of this soil moving through the atmosphere as dust. And it did enormous amounts of damage uh, to people um, in, in that area. Okay. So soil is an important resource. It's important to manage it properly. And people don't often think about it. It's not the most glamorous of subjects. And then water. Streams shouldn't look like this, OK? Um, and in some places, they do. We should have nice, pretty clear streams. We shouldn't have yellow streams. So remember, water is really necessary for life. And we've talked a lot about the overuse of things like groundwater and the effect that we've had on uh, streams. Um, but we haven't talked as much about contamination. Um, and I think mostly because it's pretty obvious that we have a lot of contamination through things like heavy metals, pesticides, nutrients, oil spills, plastics, other chemicals, things like um, commercially available like aspirin and things that don't necessarily get removed terribly easily 
from our water supply. Okay? So again, we have to manage both quantity but also quality. Okay. And then the atmosphere. So who recognizes an image on the, the top right? Hopefully everybody. It is the beautiful city of LA in the smog. Um, and so we all know that we can all feel those days when it's actually really smoggy and nasty and if you come back from LA and you're coughing and spluttering. Um, and so the atmosphere is obviously a really important um, thing for us because it contains, it's what we breathe in and out every sort of minute of every day. Um, and so we should really care about what is in our air. Um, and we're doing much, much, much better in LA. If you want to know more about this, take my atmosphere class in spring. But we're doing much, much, much better in LA about um, sort of we've controlled a lot of that smog. If you speak to your parents who were here maybe in the 70s and 80s, it was a lot worse. So we're, we're sort of a success story in that way. And now people from LA are starting to go across to China and parts of Asia where they have really severe um, air pollution problems as well. Because what's the difference between, say, air pollution and uh, pollution of the land? Who is affected by air pollution? Everybody. Air is moving. It doesn't really care about borders. And so that's the key thing about air pollution is that um, if we, when we talk about ozone, when we talk about greenhouse gases, we're not necessarily talking just sort of one country or another. We have to incorporate everybody. We have to incorporate everyone in the world for that. Okay. So some of examples of as, uh, atmospheric pollution are things like acid rain, where we're putting lots of uh, nitrous gases, so nitrogen-containing gases and sulfur-containing gases into the atmosphere, and then they reacted with the water vapor up there to produce nasty nitric acid and sulfuric acid, which then would rain out. And we didn't tend to get much of that on the West Coast. What we did was all of our gases that we put into the atmosphere would actually travel to the east and rain out on the east coast instead. So they have much worse problems with acid rain than we would. In Europe, it was the same thing. The UK, we didn't have a big problem. All our air was coming from the Atlantic and it was nice and clean. But Scandinavia, downwind of us, actually did experience all of that nasty acid rain from us burning a whole, bun a whole bunch of coal. But acid rain is one of those things that we can fix. We're doing much better at fixing that because we've been able to to fit um, technology onto a lot of our power stations to remove some of these nasty sulfur-bearing gases. Smog, which we can see there, is basically what we get when we sort of combine a whole bunch of really pretty nasty toxic chemicals. Um, and you can think of the things that LA has done. I got my notice yesterday, I need to go and get a smog test on the car that uh, hasn't really moved for a long time because so I'm too terrified to drive here. And Things like that, smog tests, you know, the, the little sleeves that you use when you put um, the gas hose into your car to stop that sort of organic um, sort of molecules escaping to the atmosphere. So all of these things we've been able to do which have helped a lot. Particulates, basically really, really tiny bits of dust. And if dust is fine enough, it goes into your lungs and it basically lodges there. It won't, as much as you cough, it won't come out again. Um, and so particularly so in Owens Valley, where we had that lake that basically dried up, um, and we're concerned about the Salton Sea for the same reason, that if the Salton Sea dries up a certain extent, all of that fine sort of sediment and dust that was the bottom of the Salton Sea will become dust in the atmosphere, and it could really have quite strong impacts on um, people that have trouble with their, their breathing. Okay. We're going to talk much more today about ozone. It's going to be our good news story, actually. Um, ozone production, um, a, a good component of that smog there is ozone. So we produce ozone deep, sort of low down in the atmosphere, and that's not really very good for us. It's not a good gas. It's reactive. It, it sort of reacts with our cells. But we like ozone much higher up in the atmosphere, okay? Remember, because it absorbs our ultraviolet light. And then lastly are changing greenhouse gases. And this is sort of a lead into next week. Because next week we're going to talk about climate, um, which is obviously, I think, one of the most important things. It's also what I do my research on. Um, and we're going to talk about what climate was like in the past, why it changes, and what's going to happen in the future. OK. So the bad news is, is that with more and more and more people, then our impacts are going to be more and more significant. Okay? There's more and more stress on these what's already limited resources. Um, and there aren't really any particularly good answers 
for how we should balance our demand versus uh, what the environment can really stand. Those are sort of moral and political and economic and social issues rather than scientific ones. Okay? I can tell you whether it's a good thing or a bad thing um, for the, sort of the, the Earth as a whole, but for the human race, that's somewhat different. The good news, and there is some good news, I promise, okay? which is that increasing awareness and education and better technology really helps us manage these resources better. And it helps us sort of try and repair them as well whenever possible. And also increasing political and public awareness of these sort of longer term sustainably, sustainable issues um, can really help us out. Okay, so I'm gonna give you one of the most horrendous examples in the US, and then I'm going to give you the, the good news story, okay? Has anyone ever heard of Tar Creek in Oklahoma? No, it's one of the most polluted places in the US, okay? It's this, basically it's a tiny town called Pitcher, and I pulled it up on Google Maps so you can work out where it is. So here is Pitcher in Oklahoma. So for those non-Americans, this is Oklahoma, okay, in the middle of the US, right in the middle, okay? And if we zoom in, then there's this little town called Pitcher here. Okay, and it's near Commerce and the other Miami. I didn't know there was another Miami until I looked at the map just before. Um, and what happened here is that this is a really, really amazing um, sort of place for zinc and lead mining. Um, but if we look at the satellite image, you see all these gray things around here? It's basically all the leftover mine waste that just got taken out from sort of mines underneath this area and just dumped on the surface. Okay. So this was a real center of lead and zinc mining. It produced over half of the lead and zinc in the US, I think up to the 1950s. Um, and that was a very important thing for things like bullets in the Second World War and all the rest. Um, but what happened was that they left behind all of these enormous piles of uh, mine waste. And that mine waste still contained really quite high concentrations of things like lead, zinc, um, cadmium, um, pretty nasty things that you don't want in your environment. And then they built a giant town there. I think the town was already there. But look at how close all of those houses are to this sort of, these uh, big piles of toxic uh, mine waste. And the problem is we didn't know that they were toxic. These are basically fun sand piles. And the children used to go and they used to sled down them and play on them and, and all the rest. And every now and again when the wind blows, all of the dust comes off from there. Um, and so the whole area is horribly, horribly contaminated. And they found this out because they started noticing health effects in the children especially because enough lead in your diet when you're young really affects your development. Um, some of the other problems that have been left behind is that this whole area is sort of undermined um, by these shafts that aren't terribly uh, stable. And when they stopped mining in this region, then all of those mines filled up with water. Again, the water table is really high here. And you can see that this shaft here probably goes 150, 200 feet down. And it's just full of this water. And you can see the quality of that water as well. Because that water is in contact with all of this area that has these horrible sort of high concentrations of metals and sulfur. And it makes the water really acidic. And you can see where one of these creeks that sort of drains from a mine joins with the regular creek water there. So this whole place is a complete disaster zone. And it's one of the places that the US um, designated a super fund site. Not super fun, like yay, super fund with a D, okay? Because they are putting so much money into trying to fix this. And it's really very difficult to do that. It's actually been declared uninhabitable. The population were forcibly bought out from their property and moved because it was causing so much damage, okay? So we still have sites like this, um, and it's still going to be a problem, and they're extending the site downstream as that water moves further away. But a happier story to end on, because we are part of this much happier story as well. So Roland Hall, where you have all of your discussion groups, was named after Sherry Roland, who looks sort of very grand there, sort of standing on his building. Um, and this was a real success, success story. It shows that we can address this. So, remember this, you're having flashbacks now to the first quarter of the term. 
And so you can see, remember, that the spectrum of light, the spectrum of light that comes from the sun, has a lot of visible light, but it also has some infrared and it also has some ultraviolet. And ultraviolet light is very damaging for us. Okay, so does the presence of absence of ozone in our atmosphere contribute significantly to the greenhouse effect? So we know that ultraviolet light damages our cells, but also does ozone, whether it's there or not, affect the greenhouse effect? I think that's more or less everyone. Right. Let's see if everyone remembers the first half of the quarter. <laughs> no one does, obviously, which is why I asked the question. Because every year, I, or at least until this year, every year I've asked this in the final exam. And I get ratios that look like this, and I go, oh, they didn't get it still. OK. So. Ozone really doesn't have anything to do with our greenhouse effect. Because, do you remember this horrible diagram from the beginning of the quarter? Yes. So, do you remember that we said that my two black lines here show the visible wavelengths of incoming radiation and outgoing radiation? Here we have the infrared, and here we have our ultraviolet. Okay? And remember that each of those different colors there. So for those different gases, so methane at the top, where you can see those colored spikes, that's the wavelength that those particular gases will absorb. So remember that we have incoming visible radiation. Most of that radiation is visible and it's coming straight through the atmosphere. Hardly anything absorbs radiation at those wavelengths. So it comes straight through, it hits the ground, it's absorbed by the Earth, and the Earth emits infrared radiation, that longer wavelength radiation. And that's our problem, that's our greenhouse effect, because now look at how many gases absorb some of that outgoing radiation. Those are the wavelengths that those gases will absorb that outgoing energy, and so that energy can't go out to space, more of it gets trapped. So now look along the, the line that shows ozone and oxygen on here. Okay? So there's maybe a tiny little spike there, but actually, where does it absorb most of the energy? On this side, most of it is actually absorbing ultraviolet radiation, okay? which isn't what the Earth is emitting. The Earth is emitting that, bit, that ultraviolet, uh, the infrared radiation. So it's not one of our greenhouse gases. Okay? It's actually something entirely different that is really very helpful that it's there, but it's nothing to do necessarily with our greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is that incoming visible that goes straight through, and then that absorption of infrared as it leaves. The absorption of ultraviolet as it comes in by ozone is something entirely different. OK? So that makes sense to everyone now. <coughs> so just a while since you've thought about it, hopefully. Yeah? OK. So how do we make ozone? So we make ozone really quite high up in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere. So remember, that's the next level up from the troposphere, which is what we live in, which is where all our weather happens. Um, and it's formed through what we call a photodissociation process, which just means that we use light to break it apart. Okay? So photodissociation. So we take our nice O2 molecule, so oxygen bonded to a mo an oxygen, we combine that with ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun, and then we absorb that ultraviolet radiation and we produce two separate oxygen ions, or we actually call them radicals because they're really, really reactive. And then each of those little oxygen, sort of lonely oxygens, goes off and bonds with another O2, and it produces O3. And that O3 is what we call ozone. That's our ozone molecule. Okay? And so this process absorbs ultraviolet light. And not only that, but then more ultraviolet light is absorbed by that ozone breaking apart again. Okay. So this is what I was saying. Down here, we don't like ozone. It's not good for us, it's bad, okay? Up at the top, that's our good ozone, and that's where most of it is and where we want it to be. That's where we need it to be to stop that incoming ultraviolet radiation, okay? <coughs>
Um, so where did we come into this as UCI? So in 1920s, some very clever people invented chlorofluorocarbons. So this isn't a natural molecule, this is something that was invented and it served a purpose um, in sort of refrigeration cleaning aerosol cans. Um, but in 1971 we were measuring different components of the atmosphere and we suddenly realized that everything we'd basically ever put of those chlorofluorocarbons, those CFCs, into the atmosphere, all of the stuff we'd put in there was still there. It wasn't going anywhere because there was no natural sink necessarily. It just has to settle out, which takes maybe a hundred years or so. And so Sherry Rowland and one of his postdocs, Mario Molina, um, and he suggested that this, the chlorine from these CFCs could actually react with ozone in our stratosphere and destroy it. And he proposed this mechanism and it turned out to be true. So don't ignore the writing for a second, that's for your notes afterwards, so just listen to me. I'm far more important. Okay, so if you look at the molecule at the top, you can see there's a chlorine there, and then that blue is like a little fluorine, and then we have three chlorines around the side. And just like we have that photo dissociation of O2 breaking into sort of separate um, ions, then uh, incoming ultraviolet light can also break apart one of those chlorines from the rest of that molecule. And that chlorine zips through the atmosphere and it finds a nice ozone molecule that otherwise would absorb ultraviolet radiation and it takes one of those um, oxygens, okay? So now we have an O2 again and a chlorine and an oxygen, okay? Not only that, so that first of all destroys ozone which otherwise would help us absorb some of that incoming ultraviolet radiation. But also, if we happen to have a chlorine and an oxygen bonded to each other, if we have one of those nice sort of single reactive oxygen ions around, then instead of producing an ozone molecule, it will produce more just O2, which isn't terribly helpful for us. And then it releases that chlorine ion to go off and do exactly the same thing again. So this is the problem is that it's not just that the CFC can destroy ozone once, is that can it can cycle around and that one little chlorine ion could actually just sort of destroy maybe a hundred thousand ozone at, uh, molecules and so that's sort of the process that goes on there okay and so he took the fight he took the fight to industry he took uh, his research off to the government and said look we are going to be in some serious trouble if we don't prevent that and they listened to him which is a really very nice thing and so the US banned CFCs. It said you cannot uh, use them anymore. And you can see that uh, when that happened in the 1970s, we did see a dip in the amount of CFCs being produced each year, okay? But the problem was uh, that not everyone necessarily believed it. This was the response of some members of government. So the interior secretary basically said, well, he wants to be outside anyway. We can just stay indoors. It'll be fine. Um, the uh, industry were really pretty vicious. There's some really interesting letters in Roland Hall. Next time you go through it, read some of those. Because they wrote to the Chancellor calling for his sort of sacking. Um, they wanted him to be fired. because They said it's just complete and utter nonsense. Of course that's not going to happen. So the CFC industry were definitely not interested in, in this. Okay, But that all changed because... In 1985, we discovered we had an ozone hole. So it's not that that ozone destruction happens by the same amount everywhere. Actually, in Antarctica, conditions are just perfect. It's cold, it's isolated, it's perfect to uh, create an ozone hole. And so you can see that we still have an ozone hole today. It's not gone away. We still have that ozone hole. Um, and so that changed things completely. So here you can see a couple of graphs. So that blue line there shows the average ozone concentration between the 60s and 70s and that red line shows you what it was in 2001. So where we previously had lots of nice ozone in our stratosphere, we basically had none. And so we needed to stop that growing, okay? Um, and so we actually then created a global treaty so you can see that after the 70s when the US ban came in, there were still other countries around the world producing CFCs, and so the problem was continuing. But actually, around the 1990s, we had this global ban, and since then, we've definitely been seeing decreases in the amount of CFCs used. 
And so this is our good news, is that it's not going to be an overnight thing because ozone or CFCs are going to stay in our atmosphere for another 100 years before they settle out. But our ozone levels are going to return to before sort of 1980 values by maybe 2060, 2075. So within our lifetime, we should see a return. So this is a good news. We work together as a, a sort of a global economy to solve this problem. So now the question is, if we want to do the same thing and look at the global problem of CO2, how can we use this experience and how is it different? And the problem is it is very different. CFCs were one industry, one particular use that we could find substitutes for. Carbon dioxide and carbon and fossil fuels basically underlies our entire economy and transportation and energy. So it's a very, very different problem. Okay, thanks guys and happy Thanksgiving.